Ready. We live. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to speak closer a little bit so that my viewers can also understand. Thank you for joining us um, on this wonderful evening. Uh, where you know we're going to be informed and learn about breast cancer. So we're bringing awareness uh, to you guys on breast cancer. I've got my two amazing <laughs> women who are my guests today, uh, Marion Peak and Floyd Fanta. Yes, uh, the, these are my wonderful guests who are going to, uh, Marion is going to be sharing um, her, the story of her life. She's a cancer survivor and um, Floyd is going to be educating us today. She's the facilitator, so she's going to be educating us. Uh, my name is Pammy G, um, and I'm coming to, live, to you live as Pammy G Motivations. So guys, um, before I introduce them in detail, the reason I, I, you know, I thought this is very important is because we as women, this is not a topic that we talk about more often, you know? Um, I, I only started thinking about breast cancer or cancer in general when I had to bury two of, two of my family members last year in November. And, um, and I realized um, that I know very little, okay? I know very little about cancer. I'm not informed because, you know, even in our circles, we hardly talk about it. It's a subject that we don't touch on. And I thought it's important that, uh, you know, people know about it. People are more aware on what to do, you know, when they, you know, when they find out or when they suspect anything regarding cancer. So, um, okay, I'm going to introduce uh, a Marion Peak properly <laughs> in detail. She's a cancer survivor, as I've already said. Okay, and she found out of her cancer in 2018. Uh, she has hormonal cancer, which she'll tell us more about it. Uh, okay, and she is also a founder, um, uh, along with her husband, a founder of Helping Those in Need. Okay, and this is an MPO that helps disadvantaged and forgotten uh, children in locations in all areas in East London. Um, you know, I've seen her page as well, where she was, she was amazing, where they were assisting with COVID-19 and, and giving people food parcels. And I know I saw another lady who had lost uh, her job and they were assisting uh, with uh, accommodation. You know, I've seen them helping people on the street that, that they pick up and they're doing an amazing job. And we're so grateful for that, Marion. May God bless you. So okay. I will give over to you now to just tell us your story because I'm sure people are going to learn, people are going to be encouraged, even if it's not related to breast cancer or cancer, but you know, people are going through the most right now with all yeah. this COVID-19, with you know, the job losses and um, a lot of things. So you know, they're going to be encouraged with the story. I like to believe that. So I'm giving over to you. Cool, so good evening, everybody. Um, it's still a little bit light outside to say evening, so it's weird, but it's fine. Um, I want to start off my journey with helping those in need because it sort of integrates into the cancer journey and uh, well, where we are now. So about four years ago, um, me and my husband, uh, we decided that we're going to be helping a children's home. And uh, we gathered some Christmas gifts and uh, food parcels and uh, party packs and the whole lot. So I went onto Facebook and I posted um, like what you do, just a list of items that I would need my family and friends. And I asked them if they could possibly buy a gift or uh, a toy that they, the child doesn't use anymore. We know how kids are, they get, they get bored with the same toys. So um, I gathered quite a bit and we had so much that we could um, bless two children's homes. With that, we had a lot of uh, women or moms on Facebook that inboxed us and asked mm -hmm. if we had a spare gift for their kids or a spare meal for Christmas day. So us, we, we, my husband and I, we just thought, you know what? There is no platform for that because if you need a pair of school shoes and you have no money, and you know how family is, you can't always turn to them. So where do you turn to? Are you gonna, are you gonna send fish flops to school? That is what normally happens. 
So we created a Facebook page called Helping Those in Need, and um, we made the page available on Facebook for needs to obviously be anonymously inboxed to us. We would then, then uh, post it on the Facebook page and either someone would then the spirit would just lead them to come and give us cool shoes or a packet of noodles. You know, there's lots of needs. We all have needs. Um, and it was amazing. It just, it, it just exploded because a lot of influx of inboxes came of needs and the donors is London has been phenomenal. They have blessed so, so, so many people. And um, it was remarkable. Um, my husband was still working full time. So I did that for about two years. Um, that was four years ago. So two years into um, helping those in need, um, mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So <sighs> breast cancer journey. Um, I had I had just given birth and my baby was, I would say plus minus 11 months old. And um, I had a lump in my breast. And we as women, we don't do the breast examination and it is so important. And I'm sure Floyd will touch on that. Um, I didn't do that. And I thought she was breastfeeding. It's probably a milk dud or a fibroid or, or something of the sort. So I, it wasn't painful. We all, we, each person's body's different. So some has pain and some doesn't have pain. Just so busy. I didn't even think there was pain. I don't think there was. But um, I obviously told my mom, you know, I have this lump. Is it a milk dud? You know, the, the, the colored way we take an olive leaf or a, a leaf and you know, you as the pumpkin leaf, yeah, you warm it and you put it on your breast. And we did all of that and this lump didn't disappear. So my mom says, let's just go to the clinic and get a referral to the hospital and see if it is a fibroid. Um, is it something else? Because we have a lot of cancer in our family. And like you said, we, we don't talk about cancer. Yeah. No one talk, especially youngsters. We don't talk yeah. about yet about cancer. I mean, I was 33 years old, and um, the doctor normally says, "Well, life says, you normally get cancer or breast cancer after the age of 35, 40 upwards. It's it's not in youngsters. I'm sure Floyd will touch on that as well. But yeah, I am 33 years old, and I'm taking my mommy with me to the hospital, and uh, the doctor obviously examined and uh, they discovered it's a three by five centimeter lump in my left breast. And it was quite a hard, mm. hard lump. So um, they sent me for a biopsy immediately, same day, like right next door into the next room. Did the biopsy and uh, they gave us two weeks to come back for results. So two weeks passed, um, we went back again. I once again took my mommy with me. Um, went in on the 14th of May. 14th of May, we went in and we sat down with the doctor. There was three doctors in the in the room. And going to hospital, you know, you don't think you're going to get bad news. I live by faith, total faith. So my thing was, I'm going in and it's going to be good news and I'm going to kick this day. And I went in. And uh, the doctor said, unfortunately, it is cancer. And... Um, we were just, I was, I was, I was lost for words. I was in total shock. And uh, the following doctor, which was actually the surgeon, um, suggested that we remove the, the breast immediately because um, it is quite a big lump. And um, I would have two weeks and um, I would have to have a double mastectomy. So um, I had two weeks to kind of let it sink in, you know, in two weeks time, breasts are gone. And um, it was quite, it was, it was very emotional. I cried, I cried for two weeks, nonstop. My husband was such a support for me uh, through the time, family, friends, the church, everybody was so amazing. And I just, I could not speak for two weeks. I was just in total shock. Um, I had so much fear. I had anxiety. I was depressed. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of those things come to pass, obviously. But um, in that time, I just, I soaked so much in the word and um, I trusted God, you know, for a fruitful outcome. And I knew that I just needed to be still and I know that he is Lord. And uh, that is, that's basically what I did for two weeks. I was very quiet and then I went in. Um, they did a double mastectomy because um, I had very really large breasts. I know most ladies would like that, but um, <laughs> I had extremely large breasts. 
and um, there was a large lump in the one side and two small lumps starting in the in the other side. So um, it was suggestible that I rather to remove both because normally it moves over to the other side. And um, I already had lymph nodes. So I decided I'm gonna take both off and I'm gonna do a total mastectomy. A total mastectomy is uh, cutting the whole breast tissue from the one side right underneath your arm all the way over to the other side. Everything is removed, all the tissue, you have no more breast tissue at all. So I opted for that option and I felt, I felt so much better. Um, I had that and then a month later, we started with the Red Devil chemo. So I took a photo. Oh. I don't know if you can all see that. That is the, the Red Devil chemo. So uh, it yep. is, yep. yeah. Um, it is four, it's four packets and I'm sure Floyd can explain why it's four packets. So you sit for about 45 to 52 minutes, depending on how much it drips, if you obviously a fast bleeder or not. But yeah, you sit in your comfortable chair and um, they either put it through your, whichever vein they can find because chemo actually, um, I would say crunches, I'm sure uh, Phil will say the, the proper terminology, but it, um, it makes your veins very small. And um, I mean, it's poison being put into your body. So they would normally do it through either the finger or through your or through your, wherever they could find uh, a nice vein so the chemo could go through. And um, I was scheduled for four Red Devil uh, chemo sessions because I opted for the total mastectomy uh, the breast tissue was uh, removed. So um, they said uh, four sessions and they would see how it went. Um, I had about three sessions and um, it was very hectic. It was very, it was very painful. Mm -hmm. um, after the first uh, chemo session, they normally say from the second chemo session, you start losing your hair. No, I went for my first session. So every morning um, I would wake up and I would have this on my pillow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if you can see that properly. But I would wake up and um, yeah, the pillow would just be full of hair and um, pieces would just be falling out the whole day. So what I did and what I suggest uh, moms do, because it's quite a, a, a shock for, for kids to see um, you being bald, you being sick and all that. So um, what I did is I took my kids into um, in a lounge, we put a towel down and I had two scissors because I have two little girls and uh, I made them cut my hair. So it was a it was a joint thing, yes. So um, the girls cut my hair, so they weren't shocked that I was bald because they cut mommy's hair, mm -hmm. and uh, dad shaved it all off, and it was a family affair, and that is how you need to basically treat cancer. It is it's, it affects the whole family, it affects everybody around you, and I like the question that uh, Pammy said. I must just um, also voice is the the emotional support from outsiders, and especially. Your, your family that cares for you, like my husband. I felt so sorry for him. Um, with with uh, you being on cancer, you are angry. You are irritated. You are nauseous. You are dizzy. You feel as if you just want to stop. Everything just needs to stop. You actually almost feel as if you, you, you can just die. That is how much it feels. And when someone comes the whole time, are you okay? Um, do you need a cup of tea? Do you need a blanket? It gets so frustrating um, for us as, as going through that, um, not realizing that, that that person actually cares. So, um, yes, so you actually have to basically tell yourself the whole time, you know, it, it's, you have to, to compromise. If you have to understand that that person is trying to be there for you. So emotional support um, is extremely, extremely important. I don't think I would have made it without my family. My family, my church, and my husband was, they were absolutely amazing. And that is, that is what pulled me through. And uh, we're very spiritual. So we do a lot of warfare. We do a lot of fasting and all that. And my mom did a lot of that. My husband did a lot of that. And I think that is what, what pulled me through because um, a lot of people on Facebook know that um, I wasn't down. Uh, when I was uh, doing my chemo, I was still feeding 400 kids every single week. I was still going out and doing ministry. I was still full out. Um, I put cancer second because it, do it doesn't come first. Cancer doesn't have to control your life. Your attitude controls your life. So 
if you are motivated and encouraged and faith, your faith level, you can survive anything, anything, any trauma. Um, so that is that is how I dealt with uh, with that during my cancer, with the chemo, and um, this is how I looked after my kids and my husband shaved my head. So um, that's how I ended up looking for for a good couple of months. And uh, the chemo I only could do three because uh, my blood blood uh, my blood cells was low. So you will touch on that. So you get your red blood cells and you get your white blood cells. So um, they need to be on the same level for you for your immune system to be able to sustain uh, the chemo. So if one drops you can't have chemo because then an organ will fail, your heart can fail, um, all of that stuff. Um, it's, it's very dangerous. So I couldn't, I couldn't do that uh, the fourth time, and I went twice, and my my blood levels just didn't want to pick up at all. And um, I couldn't, I couldn't do the fourth one, and then uh, I I picked up emphysema in my lungs. So I think it's just the immune system. It, I, it, it can be a negative or a positive. So I was on a oxygen tank for about three months. I couldn't breathe. It just, it felt as if my lungs was just squashed into a ball. I couldn't breathe. So I couldn't do the fourth uh, chemo, unfortunately. Uh, with that, I had to go on um, tamoxifen. The worst thing ever, but the best thing. So, um, there's two different types of cancer. So like I said, uh, you get the hormonal one and you get the negative hormone one. So the positive hormone one that I have is a good one, they say, although it's still bad, but it's a better one because you can actually have tamoxifen. So what tamoxifen is a stabilizer, if I can say it that way. It uh, keeps the cancer at bay. It's like a birth control, if I can say it that way. It's not really, but that is that's more or less what it is. So the cancer cell doesn't grow. So hormonal cancer is something that it has the cords. So it continuously grows. So what the tamoxifen does, it keeps it at bay. Yep. So the tamoxifen, you, you need to be on it for plus minus five years. Um, after five years, they sort of say that you're in remission if, uh, if it doesn't come back, but you are not cancer free. A um, lot of people ask me, are you in remission? And I'm only two years, it's only been two years. So I still got another three years to go until I can actually say that I'm, I'm closer to remission or closer to being cancer free. Um, cancer, unfortunately, is in all of our bodies. It is just how you live. It's your lifestyle. Um, I believe that. So if you live healthy and uh, you eat the right stuff and you don't put toxins into your body, um, cells won't won't explode in your body. So um, I've, I've gone the healthy way now. I've lost 13 cages. Yay. Um, but um, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> healthy, you know, going back to Adam and Eve's ways, eating healthy, that's the best way. Um, I love the saying that I have here. Um, I just want to read that. Um, if you don't make time for your wellness, you will be forced to make time for your illness. Mm. And that I had to learn because I always put I'm myself... writing that down. <laughs> I'm writing that down. I always, I always do that. I always used to tell myself, you know what? I will rest when I'm dead. And that was my saying to people. And I had to actually correct myself um, because if I'm dead, who's going to help everybody else? And um, I had to to step back and realize that I actually need to start taking care of myself in order to be able to take care of others. And that I had to learn the hard way. Um, but my motivation to everybody, um, stop complaining about what you don't have and start appreciating what you do have. Hmm. If you have good health, it is a blessing. We don't know the hour, we don't know the minute when is our last breath appreciate every single minute that God gives you grace for. That I want to leave you guys with. And then for anyone that wants in East London that wants to have a breast examination done, um, I've had a lot of people, since you've posted that we will be doing the talk, I've had a lot of people come in and um, ask me um, symptoms that they've had and uh, all of that stuff. So the 
Red Tulip. They're situated in Brownlee Road in Vincent Park. They have an examination. You have to make bookings. Uh, so just go on the Facebook page, Red Tulip. Every Wednesday, they have openings uh, from 12 to, from 10 till noon. And it will be with Lynn Bruce. She makes an appointment with you so you can have 10 to 15 minutes with her. She examining, examines your breast and um, you'll be able to have a clear indication of um, what is happening with your body. Um, if you, Clinics are mostly overpopulated right now. So I would suggest ladies, if you can't do your self-examination, uh, get an appointment, have it done, and as well as pep smears. Definitely, that is definitely important. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I've covered most. Yes, that's me. Okay. Oh, I've got, let me share about helping those in need. Let me share. Um, so two years ago when I was diagnosed with the cancer, um, a month before I was diagnosed, my husband actually decided to leave his job and walk out of faith and uh, join me with helping those in need. And a month later, we discovered I had breast cancer, and that is how God works. So um, you could take over immediately uh, while I had uh, the cancer treatment, and I was down and resting and everything else. And um, from from this, yeah, from the second year of uh, doing helping those in need, uh, we took in a little foster boy He's still with us. He's four years old now. He came in when he was one years old, and. Um, while I was uh, down and I couldn't be so active anymore, I, I asked uh, God, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at home and I don't know what to do. I can help people uh, virtually and I can send my hubby out, but I want to do something. And um, as a woman, when you lose your breast, for me, it was, it was a sign of like you losing your womanhood. You know, you use your breast to nurture. You, need, you use your breast to, to be a woman. Um, and I just felt I was a little bit stripped of that. And um, I prayed about it and I asked God, um, what can I do just to, just to find my serenity back in being a woman? Because I, I love being a woman. I'm so empowered to be a woman. And um, I, I spoke to my husband and I said, you know what? Um, I have so much love to give. I'm sitting at home and um, I want to shift the focus from, from my situation onto something else. And uh, Mahabi and I decided that we're going to start taking in um, abused, neglected, and rape victim kids. So wow. we marched off, yes, we marched off to, to CMR. And um, I think we, we spoke to them on a Wednesday and uh, they signed us up and everything else. And the next day they phoned us, they had two kids for us. And um, it was just, it was so instant. And uh, we took two kids wow. in. <laughs> yeah. So we took the two kids in and it was just, it was as if, as if I didn't even have cancer. It was wow. so enjoyable. The kids came in and it was two different situations. The one was 14 years old and the other one was uh, 10 years old. And the kids just loved having a mom and dad. They loved having everything else. And they each had their own room. And it was such an amazing time. And um, since then, two years ago, up until today, we have had 56 kids in our care. We currently wow. have nine on and off. Um, and it's been amazing. And it's totally shifted my whole view of, of cancer and fear because um, you constantly have that fear of, is it gonna return? When is it gonna return? Where is it gonna return? So um, with doing, doing good, you actually shift that whole focus. and. That is my, my last encouragement before I go. If you're facing any situation, if you are depressed or feeling anxiety or anything else, make a sandwich, go out and feed someone. It doesn't take a lot. Wow. Um, mm. You will feel so empowered. You will feel so motivated knowing that you have actually stepped out in faith and just blessed someone else with higher problems than you. Because cancer is not a problem. It's not a problem. It can be overcome. And it, I overcame it. And if, how many other people have overcome it? So don't feel depressed. Don't feel de demotivated to do something. Pick yourself up, pray about it, and act. Act in love. That's it wow. for me. Thank you so much, Mary. Wow. For wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank That's you. like so inspiring. Wow. You know, I can see you glowing as you talk about this. I love children. what I do. Yeah, I get so it's, excited. It's I get so, so excited. I get overexcited. 
<laughs> but yeah. Wow, thank you, Marion. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so now it's four minutes past six and we're gonna move on to, uh, can you guys hear me? I just get something that says my internet is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So we're gonna be introducing our second uh, guest now. Um, her name is Floyd Flinter. Okay, and she's a national training facilitator for uh, the Cancer Association of South Africa. Okay, and her, prof her professional qualification, she's a registered nurse, critical care, psychiatric nursing, community health care, and nursing management. And I believe we're going to be sucking her dry today of all the knowledge because we want because <laughs> we want all the knowledge we want to learn about this so that we can, you know, we can um, manage it when we, you know, um, yeah. when we suspect something and we can just do something about it instead of just ignoring it, you know. So Floyd, I'm going to give over to you um, and you have your 15 minutes and then I'll ask all the questions after. Over all to you. Right. I, I actually want to suggest that you stop the whole meeting here. I mean, there's nothing I want to say that... Um, <laughs> I mean, everything that that could have been said, Chatty. Any guys, wow. <laughs> her own experience. I just want before I forget it, um, uh, Pammy and and, yes. and 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 Marion, just remember. So we get the um, cancer offices uh, detail as well because they do clinical breast examinations on specific days there as well. Okay, so we it's absolutely essential because we're going to talk now about a breast self-examination, but if they do feel something or do suspect something, that they actually do go and have a clinical breast examination, our cancer officers are also there to help. Right, so Gavin, maybe, Mary, uh, uh, Pammy, maybe just to the end, give, give Gavin um, just to where, where exactly they are, because he brought me on on, on, on the whole platform. Yes. So the, that's the road is. Okay. Now, okay. Now, the bad, the good news is we are females. The good news is that most of us love being females. Okay, because yes. God has given us, he's, he's given us a lot. He's given us um, and I think, you know, the saying of um, educate the woman, you educate the nation. Wow. Because in our, in, our, in our homes, in our societies, whether it's male cancers, whether it's female cancers, remember, I'm going to talk from a cancer perspective now. If you educate the females, you educate the nation. Mm. And we play an extremely, extremely important role in educating people on both breast cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, all the cancers, colon cancers, because those are the bigger, the, the ones that affect men and females the most. So, so we as females play a, a crucial role in that. In any case, now uh, Marion has spoken about, but I'm going to forget now what Marion said, because, um, and I will refer back and you can ask me questions later on, um, Marion. Um, the whole issue, um, breast cancer, because we are females and at the age of 12 years, our body starts secreting the hormone estrogen. And that exact hormone, Marion, Pammy, that gives us the boobs we love, whether they're small, whether they're big, whether they're tall, whether they're hanging, whether they're sagging, whatever. they're whatever. they ours. They're part of not only sexuality, they're part of individuality. Because at 12 years, you know, at, at young, you are just a little girl. But that grows with your individuality is also your breast growing developing so mm. breasts are part of us mm. and but the bad news is that that estrogen that is responsible for us being women yeah. is the bad boy 
that causes 90% of breast cancers. So 90% of breast cancers is actually hormonal related. Mm. As Mara mentioned, <clears throat> hormones, and this specific hormone is estrogen. Estrogen is the one. So we have the two major groups of, 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 of uh, breast cancers in terms of the origin, which is the um, hormonal, and then the non-hormonal, the her type of breast cancer, which is a, a different one, the human epidermal um, receptor hormone, but 90% is the estrogen related. So it's just simply because we are females and, and you know, uh, we can live healthy, we can do the best, you know, it, I, I don't want people to feel guilty if they are those two or three kilograms overweight. I don't want people to feel guilty if they once in a month have that little Kentucky box of Kentucky, you know, but for 99%, we must try and live and eat and do our things healthy so that we can actually prevent these cancers. But in any case, let, let's go um, one. So the, the bad news is people that one in 10 people still in South Africa die of breast cancer. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's sad. And one of the major reasons, and Mary, you, you said so well, because cancer, it's a cultural thing. And also, it's, um, and it's not only under black cultures or Indian cultures um, or white cultures. It's a whole cultural thing. That the first thing is that cancer, the word, is simply... Uh, stigmatized, there's myths around it. So it's not the same if somebody gets a, a, a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, everybody talks it. It's the talk of the town, the talk around the teacup in the, uh, the, the teacher's office. But cancer, mm. there's a zip the lip. For what? For why? It's a mm. disease that develops in our bodies from certain cells that we have inside our bodies that starts reacting abnormally. They get some stimulus, which can be anything in origin. It can be um, simply um, a way of life. It can be smoke. We all know the major things are there. there. We know big. Big, big dangers are things like smoking. We know that um, uh, um, alcohol, ladies, and this is a very new one, because um, it, alcohol was very low down on the line of carcinogens. When we talk about carcinogens, we're talking about the things that actually causes cancer. In other words, it triggers a cancer cell to develop. And those things are, we all know, smoking, we know overweight, and I spoke still about overweight and breast cancer just now because there's a very important link. Um, then things like chippies, the ordinary chippies we eat, um, acrylamides, okay? Fats we take in, fats are fuel for cancer. If you go away today, one thing, and you remember, Fat fuels cancer, whether it's fats that they put in here or fat that we carry here. Same thing. Fat is the sugar and fat is synonymous. Cancer cells love both of them. They love fat, they love sugar. Okay, so overweight is one of the biggest, biggest risk factors. Um, and if we talk about risk factors, first of all, right at the top is age. Now we, um, and, and all the textbooks will tell you the biggest risk factor for breast cancer is age above 50. 
But we know, and Marion, what was your age? 33. 33, okay? 33. So we know that breast cancer, yes, the books tell us 50, 50 years of age is where it really becomes enormous, but it, we, we've seen that the cancer curve starts earlier, peaking now. So we have goals in 20s, 30s, developing breast cancer. Mm. And this is one major, major um, challenge that we as the, in the health sector must face. And that is the, the nurses at the uh, public clinical facilities, the health facilities, turn the people away for breast examinations or for that matter for patronage as well because they say they're too young. Yeah. You know, so it is such a mind shift that they need to be. And I want to every single one of us who are listening today to make sure that we will get, we'll get to the breast self-examination now, now, or a bit later on that you are not turned away. If you feel something in your breast, you stand on your right to be examined. Wow. Or to go to another clinic. If you they don't help you at one clinic, you go to another clinic or another hospital or another walk-in clinic. But you see that you get help. Because we know that the age is very definitely not, so we're talking risk factors now, Nick. We, we uh, said overweight is very definitely age, we know about 50, and then genetics. The, the third very important component in our risk factors for breast cancer is the familial history. Um, Nick, that's, that's our heritage. That is our genetic structure. But the bad thing now about this mm. is if you don't know what grandma and grandpa has yeah. okay, grandmothers or the mothers before them has died about because they don't talk about it, you don't know. But it's worthwhile, people, that we find out what was it that grandma actually died of all right, or great grandma actually died off. Was it age or was it something? And when they say, so, oh, we don't know, you know, you must not know that we don't know is probably something they don't want to verbalize. And, and, and we have, we working with a, a cancer alliance so hard um, into, and, and breast uh, health foundation, of course, to, to uh, around the myths that there is about cancer. And one of the major things in South Africa is when we talk about the um, stumbling, blood, stumbling stones, we said the major risk factors is age. It is still age, but you know the age, the age is not only 50. There's much um, younger ladies coming with breast cancer. We know the genetic line. We know specifically the BRCA gene. So if you know that in the family BRACA, breast cancer um, gene, uh, specifically BRCA2, is in any of the family members, it's a red flag because that is one of the major genetic um, components. Now, um, uh, just to go back to the... Um, to the um, cultural story. People in South Africa, and I don't know how we are ever going to overcome this major obstacle, is the culture where, uh, where 70% of our black communities first go to, even if they feel the love, in the first place, do not believe they can get cancer. So the reality is that 70% believe they cannot get breast cancer or any cancer for that matter. And then if they do feel something in their breast, they go to a traditional healer. 
So we have started a major, major project with advocacy. And you will probably all hear from, if you hang a lot, hang a lot, um, hang 10 with cancer, uh, the advocacy programs that is going to be instituted for the traditional healers to actually when they find symptoms, certain symptoms, to send the people to the cancer organization or to send them to refer them to hospitals. You know, if you get with the pimples or this and that, fine, traditional healer do it. But when we get with prostate stories and can't urinate mm. and 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 uh, lumps and swollen breasts and things like that that so so we're busy with major projects in that um, regard we already mentioned uh, age genetics and then any estrogen related okay, because we know estrogen causes breast cancer the female being female put you at risk then obviously any estrogen replacement so now what happens when we are 50 years of age 12 years estrogen starts bodies developing puberty uh, a whole life circle starts uh, menstruation um, childbirth and so forth and there we go on 50 years of age oops the ovary set, I've had it. Finish. Put. So the ovary stop producing the hormone estrogen. And what happens to the lady? Goes into menopause. And what is the first sign of menopause before uh, or together with the stopping of her menstruation is actually... Hot flushes. Hot flushes so bad that some doctors say, listen, I'd rather put you on hormone replacement before you commit suicide. Uh, because they also become very depressed and, and actually suicidal. So the doctor saying, okay, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Let's stop this whole trolley. So let's stop Pilori. Stop Pilori. Let's put you on hormone replacement. So on what do they place you? On estrogen. Mm. Mm. So there up goes your risk again for breast cancer. So we say, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. We don't want dead females over this. Okay, who's, who's committed suicide. We say that's fine. Let them go on hormone replacement, but every year they must break it. So every year, take a break from that hormone replacement before they go on, all right? Because we know that estrogen replacement actually puts them on in, in a, a higher risk thing for developing breast cancer. Okay, now if we um, look at the... Uh, uh, some preventative things. Um, we, you've, you've mentioned you've lost weight. We mentioned being overweight is, is bad news, okay? To, have, to live a healthy lifestyle include some form of exercise, not being overweight, not to smoke, to limit the consumption of, of, of alcohol, to eat your fruit and veggies, okay? And remember what I said about fat. Fat in here and on here is bad news. So whenever we and, and ladies, we in this sector, we are the culprits because we are the ones who go and buy. We see that the food is on the table. We cook it. We prepare it. <laughs> okay. So. We are the ones, if we buy that nice fish, do not put it in the batter and in the oil. It's our responsibility to grill it, to see that, our, that it's healthy, okay? It's for ourselves. It's for ourselves. It's for our children. It's part of living a healthy lifestyle. And families 
go out and walk. Families go out and camp and go and do out, go, go outdoors. Get exercise. You will be amazed if you go and Google on uh, exercise and 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 the incidence of, of cancer and particularly breast cancer. It, it there's a huge thing. Um, um, Marion, you will know Ned. Big, 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 big thing about it. Now, I just want to quickly um, mention before we talk about breast self-examination, uh, we said there's two groups of breast cancer in origin. The one is hormonal, the other one is her. Hey, estrogen related, and the other one is her. But the, the behavior of these two cancers the ductal cancer, ductal cancer that is 80% of all women who develop breast cancer develop in the duct. So it's in the duct, the milk duct, okay, that goes to the, uh, um, to the nipple. We've got the lobule where the milk is formed, then the duct that go to the nipple where baby is fed. Now, 80% is in the duct. 80% of cancers are in that duct. Now, the bad news is that 80% of those cancers tend to be the invasive. Invasion means it goes where it shouldn't go. So it means that 80% of the most, the normal breast cancers is the type that tend to invade. It's the type that tend to metastasize. And therefore, it is crucially important that we do our breast self-examination so that if there's the slightest change that you will pick it up and get to a doctor, get to a clinic, get to a, wherever you can get help. And therefore, and, and breast self-examination, ladies say, Oh, but what must they feel for? It feels so, oh, they don't know what to feel. The reason why you do breast self-examination is that you get to know what your breast feel like. Floy must know exactly what her breast feels like so that if there's an abnormality, I can pick it up. That's the importance mm. of the breast examination. So we say ladies must do their breast self-examination every single month. Um, a week to 10 days uh, after they had their period, they do the breast self-examination. But how do you do it? You take off the shirt, I'm not going to do it, okay? Take off the shirt, stand in front of the mirror, no clothes on, okay? And first of all, put your hands on your hips and check for size, shape, swelling. Then we go to the contour, or that you can contour. Is one breast swollen? If one is swollen and the other one not, trouble. Okay? If it's hormonal, both will be swollen and sore. If it's one, it's, a, it's trouble. Okay, so we look at the size, the shape, the form, the contour, we check that they are equal. We know most people are not exactly equal, so, but you know the one is a little bit bigger than the other one. Doesn't mean the one hangs on your knee and the other one sits up here. It should be more or less the same size, shape, form. Okay, then we check the skin. Check the skin for, for flakiness, particularly if you have big breasts. And if there's a tumor pushing towards the skin, it makes the skin flaky, or it looks like orange peel. And all of you who are listening or here, take your skin and put it apart, and you will see the sweat pores looks like orange peel. That's what we talk about. That uh, it means that there's a tumor pushing towards the skin, and that gives that orange peel skin. Mm -hmm. The next thing is your nipples. The nipples must be 
pro to do. God has made the nipples for feeding. So none of the nipples should be retracting. If you're born with, or if you've gone through puberty and you have retracted nipples, then that's, that's just where, the, the way God made you. But if one nipple starts retracting, it means that there's some ligaments pulling on that nipple to pull it inwards. So the nipples, no retraction, nipples, no discharge from our nipples. And we don't squeeze them, no spontaneous discharge from our nipples if we're not feeding. If we're feeding, totally different story. Okay? Then we are, and remember now, this is while you are looking in front of the mirror. Size, shape, form, the contour, um, swelling, the nipples, how they look, no retraction, no discharge on the nipples, check the skin. Then you lift up your arms. And both boobies should go up exactly the same way and keep exactly the same shape and form. Otherwise, if the one goes up and the other one doesn't, or they go up equal shape, it can be already, it can mean that there's already uh, a tumor in the breast that has grown to the bone. So when you lift up the arm, that breast doesn't go up like the other one. And that is some that is already a stage four breast cancer. All right. So are you with me? These are signs that you see in the mirror. So a breast examination is not lump, 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 lump. Breast examination is tainting things before you get to the lump. Check for size, shape, swelling, um, the contours, the skin changes, the nipple um, the skin changes, the two skin changes, nipple discharge, nipple um, not retracting, and then lift up, all right, and then must go up equal way and maintain equal um, form and shape. Then you lie down, okay? Lie down flat. We don't... And uh, by the way, I just want to close here because it's starting a big storm here. So, oh, praise the Lord for the rain. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it's so dry. It's dry with you people as well, eh? It, yeah. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll leave that for later. In any case, so now we're going to lie down. We don't go for the the in the shower, and we we have developed this way. We want let we are teaching the breast examination, uh, uh, breast self examination, because we work with the Pakamisa project. Massive, uh, we had hundreds of Pakamisa volunteers. Um, there's still some remnants at Helen Joseph and some of the places of of the Pakamisa mm. volunteers, and. Um, with uh, FTP, Foundation for Professional Development, we've decided this is the most effective. The way I've explained to you, stand mm. in front of the mirror, okay? Hips, hands on the hips, proud breast signs, so push them out. But right? you can't see mine, they're very small, so I haven't got much to push up. In any case, now you're going to lie down, okay? Lie down. And with lying down, whether you've got the biggest boobs or the smallest boobs, that is the flattest your boobs will ever go. Okay, so lie flat, three flatties. You flat, the boob is flat, your hand flat against mm -hmm. your breast. Okay, so you put it simply, let's say we are at 12 o'clock. I'm going to demonstrate. Let's say we are this one, better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our breast is like a clock, 12 o'clock on top, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Okay, so if you feel something here, you tell the doctor it's 2 o'clock. Something okay. at 2 o'clock here, I feel. Okay, now you take that flat hand. Remember, you're lying flat. Yeah. Take the flat portion of the, the 
pushing of your fingers, not this, because this part is insensitive because if you, we are busy touching things all the time. Nee. So they're insensitive to pressure. And so you use these part of your fingers to make like a little spoon. Nee. There's your little spoon. As you start at 12 o'clock, the depth, one to one and a half centimeter, depending on the size of the boot. Okay, and take it about a 50, a five rand coin, all right? Circle, okay? okay. At okay. 12 o'clock, and you go to one o'clock, and you go to two o'clock. And remember, work after, um, okay? Work crossway, knee. Hand behind the head, okay? Hand behind the head, 12 o'clock. And we go for one o'clock and two o'clock and three o'clock and that whole breast. That is how you do your breast self-examination, all right? And then you end at 12 o'clock. If you have big boobs, you have to do more than one circle to be able to evaluate every little bit of that circle. The lastly, you want to feel underneath your nipple. Just slip your fingers under the nipple, okay, to feel if there isn't something. And never, ever forget to feel underneath the arm for the lymph glands, okay? The lymph nodes or the lymph glands. No breast examination is completed until you have felt the breast, the lymph nodes under the arm. Because if, and particularly ladies, if you have nice, God willing, give you big boobs, then it's difficult to examine. And very often that lymph node is where you feel first that, you know, that there's actually a lump. So, and you do it. Exactly the same. Now you put the other arm, may work across, other arm, 12 o'clock, same. Depth, one to one and a half centimeters, start at 12 o'clock, work to two and three and four, slip fingers underneath the breast, feel underneath the arm, okay? And if you feel anything, put on your clothes, first step, okay? And then you go and look for help. Now, if you are prone, if you know that you ha have um, fibroidis type of breast, then you draw yourself a little circle, okay? On a piece of paper, here's your breast, okay? Sorry, a piece of paper, here's your breast. And you mark. I feel a lump here, okay? Okay, but shall I wait? I'm on my seventh day post menstruation. Shall I wait? Okay, wait till the 10th day and you feel again. Okay, it's still there. That means it's a persistent lump. That lump needs to be checked out. Okay, and that is how you do your a proper breast self-examination. And that is the, how the sister will actually do the breast examination on a patient. She will just, the way you do it on yourself is how you will do it. And this can save lives. People, because the, <clears throat> now she goes to the clinic, we should hopefully, remember we said the clinic sisters, Shouldn't say, tell her now, no, you're not 50, you're not 40, send her away. If I send her away, she goes somewhere else now. Okay, and we must educate the people. We must educate the people because they don't know. They don't know of better. What's going to happen then is everything that our beloved um, Marion has already um, told us that. Um, Boss Acno, let me know just see where we are at, where I am. Um, okay, we spoke about that. Now, why are we, why are we so 
adamant about they need to have to, to go for help is remember we said that 80%, 80% of breast cancers is in the duct, but it's the type of breast cancer that tends to spread. It tends to metastasize. Now, any cancer, and that is where the word cancer comes from. It comes from the Latin word, um, the creeping crab. So it has tentacles and it's going to creep somewhere. It's going, if it stays in the body, it's going, and that's what we call in medical terms, it, met, it invades. Yeah. We know this, the people invade in the cities, invade. It, in other words, it goes into other tissue. It metastasizes. And where does it metastasize? It loves to go to the lungs, four places. It goes to the lungs, the bones, the liver, and the brain. That's the four that it absolutely loves those four. Mm -hmm. And bone pain, for instance, um, as a complication of metastatic breast cancer, bone pain is very difficult to manage. In any case, we're not going to go into that. What, what's going to happen to the patient? Get to the hospital. She must get a, a clinical examination there, the doctor or whoever. Uh, she needs to get a mammogram, I will say something now, and or a sonar. If it's a young lady with very breast, dense breast tissue, then a sonar is more accurate than a mammogram, okay? Because mammograms in very dense breast tissue can actually miss um, so you can tell if, if your doctor tells you, you, but you've got dense, dense breasts. In other words, they don't give, they don't give way. Um, it means it's dense. And you can imagine a tumor can hide there in that dense tissue and the mammogram doesn't pick it up, the sonar will. Okay? Those three completed and the mammogram now show, oh my word, yes, there is something. They will do the biopsy, okay? Biopsy, where they put in the fine needle, or it might be not such a fine needle nowadays. Mm. Sorry, Marion, yeah. It might be a little bit thicker, but they do lo do local anesthetic there. So um, it's never a very pleasant, but it's essential procedure. They will do the biopsy, and then they will... Um, send obviously the, the, the um, fluid to the laboratory and according to that decide and that is where Marion's story comes in where the, so the lady is called back in to say sorry my darling you have breast cancer and this is your option remember cancer that stays in your body is going to metastasize so it, if it's only a lump, they can only do a lumpectomy. But it depends on what type of cancer it is. If it is the ductal type that tends to spread, and I think back in that's what yours was, then it means even if it's only a little lump or a little two little lumps, it's the type of cancer that can to spread. So according to what type of cancer it is, they will decide then to do um, a mast, either a lumpectomy or mastectomy, or like in your case, a married, a radical mastectomy where they take away all breast tissue. Um, and then, the, so that is to get the cancer out of your body. But we know that cancer are devious devious little things. One little cell could have broken away from the primary tumor, okay? And it takes the heart train. Now the heart train in our bodies, um, when it comes to cancer, is blood, 
and the lymphatic system. So they get on the heart line and they go to the brain or the lymph or the other things, okay? So therefore, after surgery, and if it is the type of breast cancer that tends to invade, they will follow up with chemo. And, or, or if it's just a lump and lumpectomy, they will still do radiation. Radiation, think about the torch like the radiation like It's only in one place. So radiation can't be used if, chemo, if, 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 if it has already spread to other mm. areas. Radiation can only be, think, the torch radiates that little light. Yeah. Mm. It can only radiate to one little spot. And then comes the chemotherapy with all the horrible side effects, the hair loss. And you know, um, ladies, I, I, the, the seri- the, I mean, I'm not going to go because I don't think in this talk we want to go into all the serious side effects and so on. But then comes all the chemotherapy side effects of, 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 of uh, nausea, vomiting, constipation, severe. And when we talk about these complications, they can be so severe that people stop their treatment. What does it mean? If somebody like the sister or a family member who has some knowledge doesn't intervene, that constipation becomes so bad that the patient stops their chemotherapy. What does it mean? The side effect is so bad, so huge, they rather choose to die. And Ooh. that is where the cancer association and people like a Marriott and people who are working with cancer, the, dyes, the, the disease and the diagnosis, our doors are open that people can come in and say, if I have a lump, and Sister Floyd, look at my lump, what's going on here? Okay, if they need to go for chemotherapy, come back to Sister Floyd, come back to Sister whoever, come back to Sister Reynolds, and let me give you information before you go. How can you manage constipation? How can you manage uh, nausea, vomiting? Let's give you a little week. If, because you're going to lose your hair, most possibly, if it is the ductal invasal type where you need the red devil. So if you hear red devil, you know hair gone. And, you know, before I, I close on this, the one thing that I've learned when it comes to side effects of chemotherapy, um, hair loss sounds so... I mean, what, what on earth are you talking about? They're busy curing you and you are screaming about your hair. What's your case? It's mm. our crown. You know what the word says? Okay. It's the woman's crown. Okay. So our crowns, our queens lose our crowns. Mm. And it is a very, very important, and therefore, Every cancer, um, and what you do, Marion, what you did as a family, and, and I also believe that from the word go, the whole family must be involved. Not the, not the female go and listen to what the doctors say. Hubby goes. Tonight they have a family meeting where everybody hear what is going on with mommy, okay? If it, whatever, so that if she goes for chemo, so that they understand mommy's not going to die now of this vomiting. It's a side effect. We must help her in this way. We must help in that way. We can do it, make it easier for mama this way. So the whole family must be in on this journey. And hair loss is a major thing. And therefore, the cancer organization, we give counseling. For individuals, né? diagnosed, the spouses, the whole family, we do uh, support groups where they can speak to other people. Wow. Okay. Wow. Um, and remember, we have our care homes. Gabby, if, if you, Pammy, if you can give Gabby just two seconds, we've got care homes. We've got 11 care homes, cancer, where people who live far 
can actually go and live during their wow. treatment. Okay. Wow. So the, the, the 11 care homes are affiliated with the big treatment centers. Like a they indicate with, um, um, I don't know, the one in PE, you must help me here, for Elizabeth New Oncology Center um, in Cape Town, it's Tigerberg and Groteski. Bloemfontein, it's with the, um, uh, the big treatment centers there in Durban, there is, there's Pretoria, there is uh, in Johannesburg, there's Paula Kwani, there's all over in the big treatment centers where people can go and stay. In any case, um, so we have services that we can help people um, to get them through the journey, get out the other side, and like Marion say, um, here I am. Thank God. Okay, uh, I'm not, I think my 15 minutes is long overdue. <laughs> it was good, it was good. It was good, it's very informative. Um, thank you Floyd, for that, thank you so much. Um, I think I need to make some lifestyle adjustments. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I learned, I learned. I, you know, you live carelessly sometimes because you think something like that can never happen, but yeah, I have to no, make sure. We also remember we are human. Mm. And now and then, we feel, so we say, you live 95% of the time. You really do the do the things you have to do. Mm. But if you go 5%, five, five just go a little bit off the rail, okay? <laughs> and then you come back again. Then, good. Okay, because we, we are not angels. We yeah. are still human beings. We still try a bit less for that or that or this or so. <laughs> So uh, we must still remember that we are humans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you so much. Roy, um, because we've ran out of time, I'll just raise two questions now for you and then I'll go back to Marianne and just ask another question. Okay. Um, there's a lady here. Her name is Fefe. Uh, she says, a few years ago, I had a condition called ductal ectasia. Um, yeah. It causes a blood-like substance um, inside the milk duct. Um, it came out through the nipple. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, but it says, uh, she says, so I was told that I should go through surgery to cut the affected parts of the duct to avoid affecting the entire breast. My question is, since I got scared and never went through the surgery, with the surgery, uh, won't that cause um, or lead uh, to the condition of being cancerous? Um, you know, what I would suggest, because you can now, from what, what I've tried to explain, the most cancers start in the duct. Mm. So there's now already something going on in that duct. So if I were that girl, I would most definitely go back, have that part removed, um, and actually have it sent to a laboratory and mm. let them look what's going on there. Okay. okay. So I definitely would suggest that she goes back. Uh, e even if she's moved and she's not at the same uh, unit or facility or whatever, but she needs to actually have it to uh, look at. Very definitely okay. because it's duct. And we know 80% starts in the duct. Mm. So, mm. rather say than sorry always mm. okay now there's a second one i'm just going to ask the second one and then we're going to move on because um yeah we are out of time um uh, okay so there's a lady by the name of Pumeza. um she says when they did my biopsy uh, they inserted a needle in my breast so it opened up um up to become a deep wound since early 2019. It's closing, but very, very slowly. How long does it take for the wound ulcer to heal? Um, you know, that is, <clears throat> okay, Let, let's go back. Normal wound healing takes anything from four, six to eight weeks. 
That is normal wound healing. A lady who's sitting with a hole in her breast, post biopsy, highly suspicious. Highly suspicious of something going on there. So um, I would let, I would very definitely uh, have this lady. And, and if that lady is, uh, has been to the same institution with the wound time and time again, I suggest she go in a different direction because it's abnormal. A wound should have closed in six to eight weeks. Post biopsy. I mean, Marion, you can probably tell us. Um, I mean, it's it's hardly a wound. It took me plus minus six days, and my boob was fine. Um, absolutely. I mean, to yeah. and saw a deep saw that uh, there's something going on there. Uh -huh. okay. okay, so she just definitely and just if she's been going back to the same facility. And they send her away with a packet of gauze and whatever, she better go for uh, to a different place. Okay, because there's something going on there. Okay. Floyd, one last thing, uh, just quick, a quick one. Um, if a person now needs to, um, I know there's Google, but uh, you know, some people don't use Google or anything. So if there if there is uh, people that want to contact um cancer what person should they, they contact and who to contact uh, sorry the number what number should they contact okay they can contact um we've got a what we've got a fantastic website you will not believe what is on the cancer website mary yes you you are at you, I see you in your way google's okay. bad www.cancer .org.za. You can Google anything under the sun to do with healthy living, healthy lifestyle, carcinogens, in other words, things that causes the list is long. Okay. okay. <laughs> or we also have a toll free line. Ne? If they are worried about something, all right, um, and they would like to speak to somebody, we've got a toll-free library uh, with a, I can never remember it, and it's actually so easy, 0800 Okay, so that's the, the toll-free line. Okay. Um, so that is what they can, uh, they, that's where they can get help. Uh, can, can we get to Gavin for the telecounseling line, please? Um, just one, one second. Okay, I just need. He's actually gone out. Yeah, he's gone. Uh, yeah, he's gone because he was supposed to be here, and then the video just turned off. Yeah, no, we we only have three uh, participants. It's fine. Um, if he, you know, if he can't uh, join us now for me to to accept him, then uh, we can always just have the further conversation on yeah, the face. Line, or I can, um, because I'm, I, at the moment, I know they've just launched last month the uh, uh, telecounseling line, so which okay. is an, an enormous service to patients, you know, uh, diagnosed or not diagnosed, if you're worried about something or a lump or whatever, uh, we, there is a, te a telecounseling line where there are different uh, social workers who's all been trained in cancer, the disease, the treatment, the management, and so on, so they can actually uh, contact the tear counseling lines. Okay, not a problem. I'll just have to talk to you offline and then I can just get all those details and then, or maybe Gavin, and then I can just post it um, as part of the comments on Facebook okay. so that people get access to it, okay? Thank you, Floyd. Thank you so much. That that was amazing. That was great. What did what, 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 what Marion want to ask? Yeah, I wanted to ask a quick. Okay, we got like let's say five minutes. I know. Five minutes. We're like we're like uh, scrunched. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. I'll just ask um, one question. Okay. Or well, I can always just ask Floyd offline. No, no, no. You can ask. You can ask. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my sure. question was the tamoxifen. Um. How successful is it in keeping the cancer at bay? Uh, you know, the moxifene has got a very good name. Remember, that's a estrogen blocker. 
It's it's been on the market. I think it's been the drug on the market for the longest with the highest success rate in in terms of keeping uh, hormonal related breast cancer at bay. So I think you are in on on a good track with tamoxifen. It's a very it's a very 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 uh, worldwide known. Um, uh, 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 estrogen blocker. Yeah? You, oh. Your case is estrogen or hormonal related and, and tamoxifen is a hormonal blocker. Wow. So okay. Let's stay on that versus doing natural. Um, I, you know what? I will be very, I would not leave my tamoxifen. I, because the chance, particularly if the chance, if you had a non-invasive type of breast cancer, I would still say if you really want to take the chance, I still wouldn't like it. But the one you have, which is the invasive ductal one, you cannot go you can, you can do all the other wonderful things and go on. Just be, be careful for the big, for the, for the, for the, um, for the real heavy uh, Chinese herbal stuff. It can clash with your tamoxifen. Oh. So, so don't go for both. But you can go for natural uh, vegetable oils and vegetable and the beetroots and the you know, but That's don't crazy. go for the heavy herbal Chinese stuff. That oh. can clash with your uh, tamoxifen. Oh, yeah. So Brilliant. people must watch out uh, if they take uh, stuff like medication that won't be complementary to the current treatment. Yeah, Ooh. they have to clear, clarify it with a doctor. Oh, ah. You don't want to go through all the hell and buy oh. the, you by accident, you are taking something that actually clashes with the medication, you know? So clarify medication or, 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 or herbal stuff that you want to take, uh, clarify it with your oncologist. That's good. Okay. That, that was helpful. Marian, one minute. Um, so before you, you find out of your cancer in 2018, did you have any, besides the fact that you felt the breast, did you have any other symptoms? Um, I didn't have symptoms because I had a small baby. So enlarged breast was part of it. Um, tender breast, um, hormonal, because I just had a baby. The baby was like 11 months old. Okay. So um, I, didn't, I didn't take note of the symptoms. Um, it was just a heavy lump, a solid lump. And um, I obviously asked my mom to feel because um, I thought it was something to do with uh, you get a milk fever. And I mm. thought it was something to that effect. And when mommy felt my breast, she said, no, that is not uh, milk fever. You actually need to have that checked. And I had to listen. And um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm grateful I did listen. And yeah, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. Mm, I hear you. Okay. Last question. Um, uh, what um, If people wanted to get hold of you um, for, for assistance or for contributions, for you know, assisting with helping those in need. You know, we we know that you're taking care of a lot of children. So if people wanted to contribute clothes and food, and et cetera, et cetera, what number should they contact? Uh, so you can reach us first of all on Facebook. We have a Facebook yeah. page and a website called Helping Those in Need NPO. Mm -hmm. um, all our details are on there. You can also reach me on my cell phone, 072 I am a WhatsApp addict, so I'm always at bay. Um, we have a 24-hour service, so if you have a baby and you don't have formula, contact us. Um, if you would like to give your formula that your baby doesn't want anymore, you know, uh, babies have that, um, donate that to us so we can obviously substitute someone else. Uh, we take absolutely everything that you don't want, we want it because there's a ah. need for it. So we absolutely would appreciate any contribution. Um, but yeah, the most important thing is to go on our page and you will be inspired. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, you guys. I really Thank appreciate you, you doing this. You know, 
this I've learned a lot, you know, and um, yeah, I just need to do some lifestyle adjustment. But thank you so much, Floyd. Thank you so much. That was very, that was like my book I've written. I don't know how many things I've written here. Yeah, I've, I've taken notes and I have to go back and reread my notes. So I really appreciate it. Marion, thank you for gracing us with your story. You know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's very encouraging. Guys, can I just pray before we close? Because I think we're ready to close now. Just, just two minutes or at the most. Okay. Good time. Okay. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for this um, session. I just pray that you bless these wonderful women that are doing amazing things for you, that are serving you with their hearts and their service, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that you bless them and bless their families. I also pray, Lord, for those that are watching this evening. And I just pray that you protect them. I pray that you heal those that are physically sick, mighty God, those that are desperate in spirit, those that need you the most right now, Lord, those that are crushed in spirit, those that are heartbroken. We know there's a lot that is happening out there, Lord. You know, we have gone through a lot with COVID-19 and we pray that, Lord, you start dispatching people that you use like these two ladies and start helping your people that need you so much right now. We thank you, Lord, for all the good things that you do for us, Father. We appreciate you loving us. We appreciate your grace that gives us strength every single day of our lives. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, ladies. The meeting is over. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Dark, thank you, Floyd. Okay, well, I'm home. So. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. I, I can't eat up because my dongle is unstable. Oh, okay. Safe drive. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye. Bye, Bye Marion. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.